Hi everyone, got another <coughs> lecture today on um, vector spaces again. Today we're going to be talking about dual space, so the dual space to a given vector space, um, and that's going to be the space of linear maps from that vector space to real numbers. Um, a dual basis, which is a basis for the dual to a vector space that naturally corresponds to a given basis for the vector space itself. And then covariance and contravariance, which are modes of things transforming under a change of basis. So given a vector space V, over the field of real numbers R, <coughs> and we'll call that a real vector space from now on. Then if you have a function <coughs> mapping, we'll call the function f, and it maps the vector space v <coughs> to some other vector space w. And w could be v itself. And one thing to note is that R, so the set of real numbers, is a vector space. It's a vector space over itself, the field R, um, in the sense that <coughs> you can <coughs> add real numbers together and you can multiply them by scalars, namely other real numbers. So it's a vector space over itself in that sense. So such a function f is linear. If f of alpha u plus beta v is equal to alpha times f of u plus beta times f of v. <coughs> so we require, you know, the target space of f to be a vector space because that's the only way, whoopsies, we actually have that. Uh, there we go, I think. Yeah, so the only way that this operation <coughs> makes any sense at all is if W is a vector space, namely something where you can add its components together and um, multiply them by scalars. All right, so it's linear if that expression holds um, for all scalars alpha and beta and for all vectors u and v. 
So the set of linear functions that map a vector space v to real numbers, and any function going from a vector space to real numbers is called a functional. So the set of linear functions mapping v to r And if we were talking about infinite dimensional vector spaces, which we're not here, um, it would need to be continuous or bounded linear functions. But for finite dimensions, linear is fine. Um, this is called the dual space to V. And it's going to be noted, denoted V star. The dual space V star is also a vector space. And for a finite dimensional V, it has the same dimension. One thing with the dual space <coughs> is that if we don't have an inner product space, and usually we do, but there are plenty of times that you don't um, in other applications. If it's not an inner product space, I can't really draw or you know show you a member of the dual space. You know, like you can visualize a vector but members of the dual space outside the context of there being an inner product, you can really only talk about how they act on vectors. And by the way, elements of the dual space are called covectors. On the other hand, it is the case that V and 
the second dual, so the dual of the dual space, they are the same space. And this is called, this is a property of what's called reflect, reflexive spaces. Um, and any finite dimensional vector space with a norm, you know, so a notion of length, is, uh, is going to be a reflexive space. And this here is a pretty easy thing to prove, but um, this is the canonical by dual isomorphism. And it's pretty easy to prove this result. Um, we don't have to wade through it here. Um, I don't think it would necessarily add too much to the class, or it's worthwhile, but um, I think that we have plenty of other content to go over. But I would recommend looking it up on the internet. It's a pretty easy proof. Um, it is a consequence of what's called the hain banach theorem, although it's much simpler than what you'll find for that when we're limiting ourselves to finite dimensional vector spaces. And um, I find that the Wikipedia pages on that are pretty good. So I'd recommend looking through it um, if you're curious. <clears throat> Let's turn to the next page of the notes here. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, I can't really, without an inner product, and we'll get there in the next lesson, which will be the last one, or maybe the second to last, depending on how I split things up on vector stuff, and we'll move on to tensors after that. But without an inner product, I can't really draw for you or give a picture of what the dual space to a vector space is. But we can give you a few examples. So this first example is going to be very much related to the dual basis. So given a basis. EI, like that for V. Then we know that each vector can be represented as a unique linear combination of the basis elements. Then, for example, the function that would return the second component of V relative to EI is a covector. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
right? It's easy to see that that maps V to a real number. And it would also be pretty easy to show that um, Right, if we look at the, um, the second component of this, then uh, you know, that's going to be alpha v2 plus beta u2. And so sure enough, that is alpha times this function, we'll call it f. And we'll say that this is w is equal to. So f of w is equal to that, is equal to alpha f of v <coughs> plus beta f of u. So it's a linear function to the real. So sure enough, this function is a member of the dual space, the one that picks out the, in this case, second component. But really, anything that picks out any component of vectors relative to a basis would be an element of the dual space. But you can't draw it, it's just uh, it picks the component relative to this basis. OK, another example. Let's say that V is the set of quadratic polynomials on the interval from 0 to 1. Well, sure enough, if you add quadratic polynomials together, you have a quadratic polynomial. <clears throat> and if you multiply quadratic polynomials by a scalar, you still have a quadratic polynomial. So they are um, a vector space. So one example of a vector in this vector space is, let's say, v is equal to 1 minus 4x plus 8x squared. <coughs> well, an example of a covector of this is, let's say that uh, covector omega is v evaluated at 0 0.25. So this is, let's say, 
w is defined, or rather omega, is defined as omega of v equals v evaluated at 0 0.25 for all v in our vector space. Well, it's easy enough to see that um, omega <coughs> of alpha u plus beta v is equal to alpha times omega of u plus, go away b, knock that off. Getting attacked by a yellow jacket here. Plus beta, omega, v like that, right? Because if you add two polynomials together, of course, their uh, the result at any point is going to be, you just add them together. Same with the scalar multiplication. All right, so in this case, omega of the v that we described above is 1 minus 4 times 1 quarter, right, 0 0.25, plus 8 times 1 quarter squared, so that is equal to 1 minus 1 That's not a good minus, is it? Plus 1, which is just equal to 1 in this case. Another, another example. Let's say that alpha of v is equal to the coefficient on the x squared term when v is expressed as v is equal to v1 times 1 plus v2 times x plus v3 times x squared. <coughs> Looking at it that way, you might have noticed that 1x and x squared is a basis for the quadratic polynomials. So the quadratic polynomials are a three-dimensional space. Um, but of course, it's not the only basis for it. You know, there, there are infinitely many bases that you could choose. Um, other useful examples would include the Legendre and Lagrange polynomials. <coughs> 
so in general, given any basis for the vector space V, there is a natural corresponding basis for the dual space that satisfies some useful properties and allows us to describe all elements of the dual space in terms of how they act on that basis for the original vector space. So we'll write that down here. One second, I'm getting attacked by a bee. Gonna <clears throat> have to shift myself to somewhere else, I think. Unless I attack it back. All right, it left for a little bit. That's what I get for trying to teach out on the porch. And we'll denote that as f star is equal to the set. You see how the, uh, the basis, we have these subscripts here. That's going to, the subscripts go with what are called covariant things. And we're going to use, and we'll get into this in more detail in a little bit. But um, contra, so covariant things under change of basis go with A and contravariant things <coughs> under change of basis go with A inverse transpose, where um, A is the matrix of the components of the new basis relative to the old basis. So contravariant is going to have superscripts, and covariant is going to have subscripts. So we say, oopsies, <coughs> the dual basis is denoted F superscript i and we'll we'll show why in a little bit so this dual basis And it satisfies F I, so the ith element of the dual basis acting on the jth element of the basis <coughs> for the vector space is equal to delta i j, which is to say that it's 0 when j is not equal to i, and it's 1 when j equals i. So essentially, Any V is equal to, so now you remember we had said that the components of a vector go with a inverse transpose. So we're going to give its component a superscript I because it's contravariant. 
and the basis a subscript i because it's covariant, right? It's a basis vector. I've drawn better O's in my life. <coughs> then the covector F superscript I returns the ith component of V relative to the basis f for the vector space. All right, so now we're going to do a little bit of math with that. And this time I actually worked it, well, last time I worked it out beforehand too, and I did this time, but this time I'm going to stick with the notes so that I don't get stuck, <laughs> since that'll happen. We'll start on a new page here. So under a change of basis defined by the matrix A, And now we're going to use the covariant and contravariant indices. So for something that's invariant, you know, a vector, um, it's always going to be a covariant thing times a contravariant thing. Or a covector, you know, both of them, because vectors and covectors are things that simply are. They're kind of invariant under basis, but their components will change. So we'll say that f, i, so these are vectors, you know, not covectors, is equal to a subscript i, which is the first index here, and then I'm moving over and up, superscript a, so it's indexed by i and then by j, is what we're saying here. And i is the covariant index and j is the contravariant index g j then the dual basis changes with a inverse transpose and we're going to show that in a second here i'm going to make that j look a little more convincing So fi fj is equal to 
delta i j g i <coughs> g j is also equal to delta i j I don't know why I can't draw a J today. And we have that F of I, F sub I rather, is equal to A I J times G, J. All right, we're moving this party inside, I think. That bee's getting far too annoying. sure what that yellow jacket thought it was going to get out of that exchange with me. Most likely outcome was me stung in it dead. But that doesn't do either of us any good, so I guess we're teaching from inside now. All right. So back to that. All right, so we can replace fi in this expression with this now. So that is a, now we have to be careful not to reuse j since we're already using j um, here, right? So when we use, uh, use this, we'll have to use K here instead of J, since J is already in use. So A, <clears throat> I, K, G, K, times f j, so that's uh, this one here is in the dual basis, and this one here is the basis. <clears throat> well, that has to equal delta i j. which is also equal to g i the vector times g j the covector all right so we know that uh, there's going to be a linear transformation from between the covectors. Um, so let's just call that transformation B. And we're going to find what B is equal to. F I, your covectors, you know your dual basis elements here. We'll say that they are equal to 
B. And now I is the first index, if we think of B as a matrix. So that's your row. And then your column, which is your second one, is going to be L. And then times your original um, dual basis element, GL. All right, so we're going to substitute this in. And actually, let's make that I a J, since we're going to be using it as a J in a second here. All right, so we're going to take this expression and substitute it in here for FJ. So we have A, I, K, G, K. B, J, L. Let's make that K more obviously a subscript. And then G, L. Let's remember these are vectors. That's the vector basis. And this is the dual basis. And that is equal to delta i j. So you recall that you know this is f sub i, and this is f super j. We've just re-expressed them relative to the g's. All right. Well, you remember that this is all just numbers here. So we can move those matrices around. Um, and it's the indices that kind of keep track of all the order, as is usually the case with our index notation. Um, we just, when we have the superscripts and subscripts, we still have to have, you know, which was the first and which was the second is why we, you know, leave these spaces here because otherwise it's easy to lose track. Um, it was, you know, that was a little easier to keep track of when we use all subscripts, but then you lose the covariant and contravariant and you can kind of mix yourself up. <clears throat> all right, so we got that. And we can rewrite it as, if we use the pen, A, I, K, B, J, L, G, subscript K, G, superscript L is equal to delta I, J. Well, this here, because it is the um, the basis acting on the dual basis, or the dual basis acting on the basis, there's a symmetry to that. Um, it doesn't matter. So you can just think of it as a product. Um, it commutes. Then this is delta k l. All right, so we have A, I, K, B, J, L, delta K, L is equal to delta I, 
j. Well, if we look over here, this whole side is 0 unless k is equal to l. So we can get rid of the delta and just replace l with k, since we know that all terms are going to be 0 when l is not equal to k. So we're just getting rid of this dummy index and getting rid of a bunch of terms that are 0. So a i k b j k is equal to delta i j. Well, of course, this is going to be the case when b is related to a's inverse, right? So that is going to be like this. a i k times a inverse um, k j, so k is the first index and j is the second index here, is equal to delta i j. So this is just the definition of the matrix inverse, right? When you multiply two matrices together in normal order, it's the, uh, the second index on the left one and the first index on the right one are the ones that are repeated. So this would be we are right multiplying A by its inverse. All right, but that doesn't quite look like what we have up above. So in order, right, what we have up above is kind of the transpose of that. So I, things moving around on me. <clears throat> All right. So rewriting what we have above. A, I, K. So we want our indices on this term here to look like that. In other words, we want the, uh, the contravariant index to be first and the covariant to be second, whereas here we have it the opposite. So that's where the transpose comes into play. Um, So A inverse transpose J K like that. So now J is the first index is also equal to delta I J. Um, so all that we're doing is we're taking the transpose of A inverse transpose in this. So this is just A inverse times A again, but we've fudged with the indices now to make it so that it looks like the above. So what we can say from this then is that B is equal to A inverse transpose. So under a change of basis defined by a matrix A, So that would be fi is equal to a 
i j g j like that um, one basis vectors transform with a um, by definition And that's called covariant because they go with A. And we're saying covariant is in they vary along with basis vectors. So yeah, they vary with themselves. Uh, the components of a vector go with A inverse transpose. So the components do what we call contravary. They vary against the basis elements, and that's how vectors end up being invariant under change of basis. The dual basis vectors also go with A inverse transpose we just showed. <clears throat> All right, so if we wanted to send GI to the corresponding fi go with a inverse transpose And the components of a covector go with A, so they covary. We'll say the covector is omega is equal to omega i g i the dual basis and we'll say that is equal to omega tilde i f i um, well omega i tilde is equal to a inverse transpose i j omega j. Excuse me, no it's not. That's just a, duh. You'll be able to show that. Um, let's erase that, though. 
right, so the components of a covector co-vary with change of basis, um, while the components of a regular vector contravary with change of basis. And that's because the vectors themselves, the basis vectors themselves, co-vary by definition, since we're talking about the change of basis matrix. Um, and the dual basis vectors contravary. So to get something that doesn't change, you need the components to either go with, you know, if it's a, a co-vector, then the components have to go with A while the basis goes with A inverse transpose for your dual, for your co-vector not to vary under change of basis. And for your vector not to vary under change of basis, its components need to go with A inverse transpose while the basis vectors go with A. Um, so one thing that kind of causes perhaps a little nomenclatural confusion, um, a vector whose components go with A is a, uh, a covariant vector. So in other words, covectors are covariant vectors. Or it transforms covariantly. And to see what I'm talking about, it um, might be useful to skip ahead in the textbook to chapter 13. The chapters are pretty short, a lot of them, you probably noticed. Skip ahead to chapter 13 and just kind of have a read through that. Make as much sense of it as you can and um, see how that relates to this. And then, you know, we'll come back to it in a little bit here. All right. So this whole Einstein notation stuff where we make the, um, the covariant indices subscripts and the contravariant indices superscripts, you don't necessarily have to know it for this class um, because once we use an inner product, we'll be able to use subscripts for everything, and we'll show you why in a little bit. Um, but I find that trying to understand things in this sense where you, you use the covariant and contravariant indices ends up being helpful um, because with the subscripts, what we're doing really only works out when you're talking about an orthonormal basis. Um, whereas if you use 
the you know, covariant and contravariant and the basis and its corresponding dual basis, then it always works regardless of your choice of basis, you know, and, and the summation in the real Einstein notation where you keep track of covariant and contravariant, you can only do the summation, you know, the dummy index has to be a covariant component times a contravariant component. So you're constructing, you know, either a vector or a covector. Um, and it makes it so you can't screw things up or make kind of useless things. And, you know, it, well, it, it'll really help if you're ever doing anything that doesn't have or isn't using an orthonormal basis. Um, we'll show in a little bit when you have an orthonormal basis, which can only exist when there's an inner product. Um, an orthonormal basis is its own dual basis, um, because when you have an inner product, you can identify the dual space with the original space. See what else we want to talk about here. Yeah, so like I said, the big benefit of Einstein notation relative to using all subscripts is that you can uh, avoid making any sort of mistake. It'll work every time as long as you don't like accidentally, you know, switch indices or something. Um, if you follow the procedures with these, you won't end up with an incorrect expression. Whereas the other way, if you like, for instance, forget that it's restricted to orthonormal bases, you will end up with something that doesn't work. Um, all right, that's all we got for today, or at least for this lecture. I'll uh, get back with the rest of the, uh, the stuff on vector spaces. And when we cover inner product, you'll be able to do problem four on the homework. Um, and then after that, so we really just have inner product and cross product left for vector spaces. And that'll, you know, restrict us, the cross product will restrict us to three-dimensional vector space. We'll see. Um, and then from there, we'll move on to tensors, have a couple days of that for algebra, and then we'll move on to calculus. Hope you enjoy your Labor Day weekend. Catch you later.